ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter Defty. Okay. So they put me up here and don't teach me how to use the thing. Okay, so it's kind of ironic because um, I'm here to speak on the future science of fat adaptation for athletic performance, and I don't have an MD or a PhD behind me and, um, or any certifications, but I think the point of that is, is that when you know how academia works and medicine with uh, malpractice and, and stuff, uh, researchers can't really speak outside the body of science. And that's where we're going today. We're going to look at the, the future of this. And, and to a point, uh, I've been doing this personally since 2000 and professionally since 2007, 2008 with my company Vespa. And um, in 2010, I had a meeting with uh, Dr. Stephen Finney. And he was the first researcher who actually said, no, this is not just possible, it's real. And, and for years, we've been having these wins and athletes were doing things and it was very, everybody was saying it was anecdotal, researchers were dismissing fat, it was all about the high carbs. So today I'm here to kind of delve into what that future looks like because after that first lunch meeting with Steve Finney, that was in 2010, it took five years over five years for the publication of the FASTER study. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but just think about that. This was all happening and occurring, but it took five years for that science to get developed, to start changing the course of things. All right, so. Uh-oh. Oh. Okay, so the future is now. So quickly, um, I work with, Uh oh. We work with a lot of athletes. That's Roman Bardet. He got third of the Tour de France this year, second last year, winning stage 12. But we also work with a lot of real world people. This is Diane Credenda here on the right here on the left. She won her age group there in the Ironman 70.3 St. George. And, and I left the fourth place finisher in there because, as you can see, this is a fat adapted athlete. This is a high carb athlete, and you can see some de novo lipogenesis, you know, loss of muscle tissue because you're, you know, burning through the carbs. And I, I don't mean to make fun of the person, but this is what fat adaptation does. And then another real world person is Roxanne uh, Woodhouse, and that's taken at Lake Tahoe, and, and she's 54 years old, and she's on her way to winning the female title at the Tahoe Rim Trail 100 miler. Last year, she did, she won the Tahoe Rim Trail. 100 miler, then seven weeks later, she won the female of the Tahoe Rim 200. So these, there's real people out there doing real things. And um, we've kind of got this reputation that we're all about the endurance sports and we don't do um, strength and conditioning type stuff, but that's not exactly true. Here's Lindsay Boston from Reno. Um, she's gotten fat adapted and she's a top Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitor now in her weight class. And then this guy here, um, the guy here on the right, take a good look at his body composition compared to the, the box owner there. That's Kevin McVeigh. He's, a, he's a, a Northeast rep for the North Face, and that's him in his local box. And he's smiling ear to ear because he just completed the Memorial Day Murph, weighted Murph vest competition, and he smoked the entire field, including the, the local box owner who's 10 years younger than him. So this is not just an endurance thing. This is about strength, intensity, speed, agility. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the science. As I said, faster. Um, I had a little bit of a piece in that. Most of the low carb diet cohort were athletes I actually worked with and coached and, and specifically to a point so you know, the ones that are actually setting records and winning competition, they don't do straight keto in the real world. They did in the lab, but in the real world they practice what I call optimizing their fat metabolism. Okay, so just as a little review, how many of you not familiar with FASTER? Pretty much, okay, just a few. So most people know about the FASTER study. So we're gonna look here. FASTER showed that athletes on average when they're fat adapted could burn well over one gram of fat per minute, which before that, the previous study said only outliers could, could burn up to one gram a minute. So huge change in how much fat an athlete could burn. 
Secondly, they not only could burn more fat per minute, but they also moved their crossover up to that 70 to 80% of their VO2 max, which is right in that sweet spot for endurance exercise. And as you can see from this graph right here, the ability to, to tap into that unlimited energy supply is a game changer, okay? So this is the science, this is established, and we all like to, to you know, we all like to point to the science. And, and, and the science has, has kind of become a security blanket because we don't want to be wrong, we want to have something to back it up, we want data. Um, I'm not the data guy, I'm the run and gun and get it done guy, but we, right now we're about to jump off and the way I've structured this talk in terms of, of the future of fabrication is I've structured it to give you in ways to talk about these uh, future events in ways that can give you tools and understanding to take and use for your own uh, fat appetitive journey, okay? So, it's a little murky here. So, to start with, one of the two first things I've, I've come to realize is it's holistic, okay? The, and the problem with this is because it's holistic, fat adaptation is very holistic, it counters science, science and science studies because when, you, when it's holistic, you're dealing with everything and everything's moving and changing. And when you're doing studies, you're trying to look at one thing and control all the variables. So the, the, the way that fat adaptation is gonna work for people, it's, it's really about taking the science to use as a guide and then incorporate it into a very holistic net, network. Secondly, it's very individualized. We see things across the board in terms of how well people adapt and perform and what it takes to get them to perform. So while somebody will adapt in two to three days and they can be pretty extremely low carb and, and perform their best, somebody may need, take two or three weeks and may need to have some level of carb strategically in their, in their diet. Okay. Now, I, I just want to give our pyramid just as a quick thing because, um, as you see, it's a holistic and individualized hierarchy. But what we're going to look at here is the next thing, which is the fat adapted metabolic state. Now, the, key, the keto movement, I'm a big believer in nutritional ketosis, but for, for the performance end of athletics, that's the foundation. You know, when you, go, when you go to look at a house, everybody drives up the house, sees what it looks like, but nobody looks at the foundation. But do you need a good foundation? Absolutely. Otherwise, you're gonna build that proverbial house of carbs. And so that's what we do, is, is getting that metabolic state is, is just key, and usually it, most of it starts with just a dietary change. Um, the other thing that's key to note is because of that wide spectrum of variation and individualization, I would like to offer to the audience that ketosis should be a goal, but it, it, it shouldn't be an, an absolute because we see a lot of athletes who try to get themselves adapted and for one reason or another, they're just not adapting into ketosis and then they start to str their body start to physiologically stress and then they start to dig themselves an adrenal hole that gets even more complicated later. So let's move on here. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the strategic carbohydrates. We found that carbohydrates do play a role when you're a highly conditioned, fat-adapted athlete in terms of getting that performance. So what I've seen both in the literature and in the real world is that you can get, a, a hyper adopter can get 80, 85, 90% there, but they're still gonna miss that top gear that they really could for the absolute performance that carbs provide. And as you can see, I went, I specifically went to the USADA, U.S. Anti-Doping Agency website, and here they are, they're saying, you know, your performance can be improved by carbs, and, and that's sort of been the mantra, but in the good old American way, if a little is good, more is better. And that, we'll get to that, oh, what would happen here? So, I went to their recommendations, and this is pretty standard, so their, recommend, their recommendation USADA's recommendation for daily intake, not carb loading intake for an athlete, 160 pound male athlete, 400 grams a day, okay? 
Now, I'm making that point because everybody in this room knows that's insanity, okay? But what I'm trying to offer here of that fat adapted foundation and the opening of that metabolic window of carbohydrate tolerance once you're adapted and athletic is you look at the keto world and the science is suggesting 50 grams a day tops, right? Okay, so you got 50 grams here, you got 400 grams over here. Think about that. That's an eight-fold difference, okay? So once you're adapted and you're athletic, that eight-fold difference gives us quite a bit of range to play with those carbohydrates to find that, that carbohydrate tolerance level to get that optimum performance with the littlest amount of carbs and not get the downside effect. So, you know, what we've seen is 50 to 150, 200 maybe on hard training, um, weeks of hard training. For events, it could be even more than that. And then cycling down the carbs back low to that 50, 30 gram level when you're in recovery. Okay, but I think it's kind of funny because you got USADA here, who's, you know, Travis Tiger, the guy going after Lance Armstrong, all about keeping us away from drugs. And, you know, my question is, who's the pusher? Okay, so here's how I look at uh, carbs, and this is on our website. Oh. Okay, so what I'm offering here is to look at concent concentrated forms of carbohydrates as a legal PD, because it meets all the definitions of a performance enhancing drug in terms of what it does to enhance your performance in the short term, but also the downside effects. And I think that's not lost on anybody, but that's sort of the kind of message I want to get out there and, and you guys can help propagate. Because when you look at it as a legal, fairly safe PED, if, as long as you're not doing 400 grams a day, um, it fits and it's a good conceptual model. Okay, so the next thing that I want to bring up, how many of you guys been chasing your ketones if you're athletic? and finding your low ketones. I see some hands, okay? Stop chasing your ketones if you're an athlete and you're doing any volume of exercise because what is the body of science currently based upon? Does anybody know that? Okay, the body of science in ketosis is based on a relatively sedentary population, okay? When you become fat adapted, it's a different world, and we've seen this trend where this is more likely, if you're a well-adapted athlete, that's more likely where you're going to sit in terms of your blood ketone readings, because with the blood ketone readings, it's not what's in your blood, it's what you're burning, okay? Now, this is something I've been struggling with, because everybody talks about recovery in athletics, and, and everybody knows that here that when you're doing athletics and you're fat adapted, the recovery is so much better because, of the, because for a number of reasons. And so I want to give a couple of really stark, how many of you guys have noticed the recovery? Pretty much everybody's noticed how well you recover, right? Well, get, start looking at how, just how good you re can, can recover. This here, this is Ethan Passant at the Leadville mountain bike race in 2008. And he's leading the, the eventual winner, Dave Weems, who, who's a legend, won it. And this guy here, he's from Austin. He's got a pretty good record in cycling. Um, but he, won, he placed fourth at the Leadville 100 mile mountain bike race. And he led the pack for a pretty good amount of time. He did that one week after winning a 508 mile self supported trail uh, mountain bike race. We got Jeff Browning here. Okay, and here's Jeff, and Jeff, uh, last year, he finished fourth at the Hard Rock 100-miler, um, which is a, a really, really tough mountain 100 where you go over a lot of passes that are 12, 13,000 feet, and he, and he broke what they call this esoteric thing, the, hard, the Western States Hard Rock Double, which is two races, the combined times. He broke that record by an hour and 21 minutes. And he did that just 19 days after finishing third place at the Western States 100 milers, which is one of the most competitive 100 mile races. Goes from Squaw Valley near Lake Tahoe all the way to Auburn across the mountains. Okay? And then you got, 
the hair cap in there. Screen went blank. Oh, there we go. And then you got Jesse Haynes, who won the, won, uh, he goes 10th, he, he um, won the Tahoe Rim Trail, the one that walks, Roxanne won the female last year. And again, he did that 28, 20, just 20 days after finishing 10th at Western States. So it's really about minimizing damage. So that's, how, that's the message I'd like for all of us to get out there is you don't recover faster. You've just not the, done the damage from the oxidative stress, the lactate load of just burning through a bunch of glucose. Okay, so how many of y'all heard you don't need to do big cardio? You can get by with intense sessions or probably some of you have heard that cardio is bad, right? Again, what's the whole body of science for cardio based upon? It's based upon most athletes using a lot of carbohydrates to fuel their exercise. So when you're doing cardio, you're doing volumes of exercise, and if you're fueling it with volumes of sugar, guess what? Not so good. However, with fat adaptation, cardio is good. It's actually very good. And this is one of the tough things because nobody likes to do cardio, including me. It sucks. Okay? But when you're fat adapted and you have your nutritional balance and, and everything just right, what we've seen in terms of gains uh, in the real world are just phenomenal. And not just for endurance sports, but for strength, conditioning, velocity sports, tactical athletes, etc. Okay? Next thing. Okay, so now. One of the things for fat adaptive performance, it's not about the, butter, the bulletproof coffees, the MCT oils, the nut butters, the ketone salts, the ketone esters, and the fat bombs, okay? I'm not knocking these, you have these plays in the diet, but a lot of people, I see a lot of people in athletics trying to fuel themselves, going keto and trying to fuel themselves with keto-based keto -based type of foods. And that's a huge digestive cost, and it's also missing the point. And when you're doing that, as Dave Feldman's going to explain tomorrow, when you bring in a lot of exogenous fats, you're not learning to use your body's own endogenous supplies. And it's really about first getting your body, uh, as Jean up there says, she really notices the switch. Get those pathways upregulated, the hormones and enzymes necessary to burn fat at high rate. So you're really looking to tap into that onboard fat supply first and then once you get it going either a little carbohydrates maybe a ketone salt or maybe if it's really cold then you could do a fat based thing i don't recommend fats for racing because of the digestive uh, cost and the resources it takes to do that all right okay so that leads to what are we using and this here we're using fatty acids, so if we're not using the fat bombs and the bulletproof coffee, we're using fatty acids, and guess what this is? This is an LDL particle, okay? And, that, and when you're fat adapted and get your cardio up, those nasty LDL particles that everybody says are bad and they're gonna atherosclerotic and gonna kill you, those become a very important and large part of the supply, ketones, do play a critical role, but they're not doing the heavy lifting. It's beta oxidation. And LD, I think the future science is going to show that LDL in a fat adapted athlete, actually it's doing what they're supposed to do. You don't have them sitting around getting oxidized, accumulating, et cetera. They're getting metabolized the way nature actually meant, meant us to do that. Okay, now there's, there's also a very human component There's a very human component to this, and to, for fat adaptation to work, we need to learn how to deal with these modern stresses in a better way and try to eliminate them. It's, it's, as everybody knows here, when you stress, you ping your cortisol. Cortisol is your fight or flight, which means, guess what? You want your sugar because you need that quick jolt, okay? And it, it goes further than that. It goes to things like getting distracted with all these buzzwords, you know, the dopamine ping and getting freaked out, you know, I don't like people to get freaked out about, you know, whether they're doing grass-fed or grain-finished beef versus or eggs or whatever. 
you know, just all these, how many of you have gotten caught up in all this verbiage, what, you know, back in your vegetarian days or whatever, whatever you, wherever you were, you know, all these things are buzzwords and people are, you know, this is one of the things that I, I really preach. I don't like that everybody's instilling fear into everybody because fear is going to not help your fat adaptation. Okay, paleo, keto. Okay, we want to get off all this stress and including these buzzword stressors. Just the basics. All right, and the last thing we're going to talk about um, before we wrap it is technology. Okay, we have too much technology around us. I don't expect anybody here to let go of their cell phones or their computers, but we have to learn how to live with it and find doable ways to mitigate the downsides that we're not told about. I mean, how many of you are really aware of the, uh, the impacts of non-native EMF? It's huge. So. Um, this is your red blood cells, normal, healthy. These are your red, ble red blood cells when you have your phone next to you in carry mode in that area right next to your phone. And these are your red blood cells with your phone in active mode talking. So I just want to leave you with these kind of uh, images so you can see that the technology has great benefits and I'm not suggesting we drop it, but there's some unintended consequences we need to be aware of. Okay, so Christopher Lloyd, Back to the Future, and that's what I'm talking about here. Um, what started me on this when I bonked at my first marathon in 2000 was what were the evolutionary pressures that shaped us? And I started thinking about the Maasai and how they, they do just fine health and fitness-wise on a, on a diet of blood, meat, and milk. And I changed my diet, ran three marathons, had no issues whatsoever. And that got me on that, my journey back in 2000. And so we're going from people like the Maasai and the Hudsa to an athlete like my friend Simon Machui here, um, who's part Maasai, and that's Mount Kilimanjaro in the background. He owns a trekking company that takes people up to the top of Kilimanjaro, and he holds the fastest known time unsupported known time of ascent, descent of Kilimanjaro, and he's a 10-time sub-24-hour Western States finisher. Or, you know, going from those Aboriginal tribes of Australia and New Zealand to the All Blacks rugby team who dominate their sport using low-carb uh, strategies, okay? So what's out there, what I'm going to show you here are there's a new paradigm of fitness, health, and performance out there. This is Doug Berlin. Uh, he's uh, one of the athletes profiled in the back of the art and science of low-carb performance. Traditional gym guy, owned four Gold's gyms, weightlifter, bodybuilder, everything. And then he got into ultra running, and then he went back in the gym. And he, also, he said to me, it's Peter, I've been a gym rat since 13. I've done everything out there, including a couple of things you don't want to know about, and this is by far the best. And he got leaner, he got fitter, and he said, I could kill people in the gym. Or Jenny Capel here, um, who came to me somewhat broken because she was having a lot of GI issues. So this is the kind of model we're looking at for health and performance out there. Thanks very much. Okay. All right, so any questions? I don't see anybody at the mic to questions. I guess we don't have any questions. If you, wanted to, if you want me to, oh, we do. Um, also, if you want to talk more in depth, you can come by our booth and I'll talk your ear off if you want more detailed stuff. Yes? Um, I'm a rugby athlete and I work for Austin Elite Rugby, the new pro uh -huh. team here, and we're just getting our program together. And I think that what you mentioned about the All Blacks kind of normalizing low carb eating in the athletic world, um, I would like to know uh, just the basics of before we go into, into a competition, I usually go into my games fasted just because I'm too amped up to What's eat. That I about? usually go into my games fasted because I'm too amped up to eat. Uh -huh. um, but it, it begs the question, if we're not supposed to be eating carbs, but you don't want us to be consuming fat before we go in because of the digestive toll. That's right. What are, what are we doing immediately to prepare? I'm very strict ketogenic, but I don't really know how I should adapt that before a game. Well... You know, it, de it depends. Once again, this is individualized. So, so for you, but 
different for your teammates, mm -hmm. you may want to do what we call a carb sneak, where you sneak some carbs in the night before mm -hmm. under a blanket of fat like a loaded baked potato mm -hmm. or a really rich risotto, like sour cream cheese. You know, you, you have that fat in there to slow the glycemic load and you start on your protein course first. You know, get the stomach juices turning so that that, that insulin spike isn't too, too great and then you can absorb those carbs, saturate your glycogen source and be ready to have those extra quick, quick reserves. Because mm -hmm. the All Blacks aren't straight keto they're using some low carb yeah, strategies and you and you kind of need that um uh, to to do that and like i said what works for you now it's it's all about finding that tolerance level okay and then once you're in a game you know like having a little something uh with some sugar and stuff isn't the end of the world for most athletes but you do like also you need to hydrate really well which means a lot of salt mm-hmm People, people get pretty shocked to see how much salt they need when they're fat adapted. And what would you say are the best resources for those of us who play on teams, who coach teams, to be able to, to um, advocate for this to our teammates? Because well, I, I get a lot of resistance it, to it. Yeah, no, I, I know. And it's, it, I've been doing this for a long time, and people laughed at me. It's just like, you just, it takes, like in marketing, they say it takes seven to nine memory imprints yeah. before somebody will buy something. And so you just have to keep showing them because, you know, I've been there. You, you, they see the results. They see how you're maintaining your, your fitness and your lean body mass. And they, there's just this disconnect because they're going back to their, their way of thinking, that, that belief system that they can't, that security blanket they can't let go of. Yeah. Right? Um, so you just have to keep showing them. And, you know, that's why the, the real science, like, the faster study need to be done because um, for guys like me who are innovators, who aren't, you know, we're ahead of the science in Jeff Bollock's world, if the science doesn't follow up and show that it's valid, I'd still be considered this, you know, guy yeah. who's a village idiot talking about fat, you know? Does that make sense? You have to kind of tell them. And now that there is some science, you can start pointing them to that thing or send them some links or stuff because now there's there there is quite a you know it's it's starting to get you know uh somewhat known out there okay so I, i'd say you, you kind of hit them at multiple angles to put chinks in the armor of that belief system all right we'll keep working on it thank you thank you hi i see chasing ketones as sometimes potentially leading to inadequate calorie or protein intake and i'm wondering if you can elaborate on the idea that milder levels of ketosis can sometimes indicate just higher burning or efficiency. I'm glad you brought that up because that was something I, I didn't get to put in my uh, talk because of time constraints. But what we see shifting is that if you're an athlete, the protein macro becomes a lot larger. It's not like 15 to 20, it's like 20 to 30 percent. Um, what was it? Finish off what else? Uh, and so I'm wondering if you could elaborate on uh, milder ketone levels, potentially meaning more efficient use of ketone and so more burning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, it's like I said, it's not what's in your blood, it's, it's what, what you're burning. And so that's, why, that's what we see happening and speculate is happening because I've got some people using the ketonics and they're, they're showing low low blood ketones but they're blowing in the 50s and 60s in the, on their ketonics now the other thing that's interesting that most people in ketosis in the keto world do not understand or know is that in the krebs cycle when you're fat adapted and everything's going you're spinning off oxaloacetate and it's being converted to acetaldehyde and acetaldehyde um, the whole thing of that that ketone is a, is a very um, unstable ketone. So, but I think on an on a intracellular level, it's actually, there's a significant amount of ketones being produced through the Krebs cycle and immediately being burned, metabolized for fat. So, and you're, that's not even showing up in the blood. So it's, it's, it's a very complex thing. And unfortunately, I think that that's gonna be very tough for the science to show because we love metrics and it's hard, it's gonna be, I think, on a, we know the pathway, we know that this occurs, we just can't measure how much. Thank you.
Hi. Again, one more question, kind of related to the others. So my competitive sports are both bodybuilding on the one hand and marathon running on the other, which are two very different activities, depending on where I'm at in my training cycle. Talk, talk slower and louder because I'm deaf. Oh, no problem. I was just saying that I, my two athletic activities are bodybuilding on the one hand and yep. marathon running on the other, which are obviously very different from a training standpoint. Okay. But from a nutritional standpoint, I've found that my running has gotten better the more that I've decreased my carbohydrates, increased my fat consumption, and yep. I've totally changed what I do when I run as far as what I eat, whether I eat, all of that. Yep. But when I'm bodybuilding, I hear constantly, and it's beaten into my head, that you have to have protein, you have to have a lot of protein. And so my protein levels are pretty high, which I'm assuming, without yep. testing, are kicking me out of ketosis fairly regularly. And I guess I'm just wondering, do you recommend or would you advise that for that kind of competitive sport or other sports where there's a heavy amount of muscle building involved, that the protein is increased even more beyond the regular um, keto recommended levels? Well, once again, it's, it's very complicated. I'm not trying to defer here, but, but for muscle generation uh, definition, um, it's not, it's not altogether a bad thing that you have an insulin response. Insulin is not the bad guy we've we made it out to be because insulin actually, in an insulin sensitive person, insulin is one of the most anabolic hormones. Mm -hmm. So when you're bodybuilding, that little bit of insulin you have because you, you are fat adapted helps you to put on muscle tissue and it's coming from that protein. Got it. The other thing we suggest is one of the first things we do is we get athletes off snacking because snacking totally messes up that delicate dance of insulin, ghrelin, and yep. leptin. And so, but the other thing that, that people don't realize that, that I came up with several years ago was, was when you don't, when you, when you go between meals, like long times between meals, even if, if you're working out a, a, day, um, a lot, it's three meals a day, okay, your body, your, your, your gallbladder is going to accumulate bile the way it's supposed to. And then when you have a high fat, moderate protein um, meal, it discharges that bile, in a, in, so it keeps your bile ducts clean, but also that bile emulsifies the fat, which is, and the stomach acid breaks down the protein, which allows for much better protein assimilation. So part of it's having higher protein, but you want to have it with the fat, so yeah. you could have like say 25 or 30% protein and get better assimilation, I'm speculating here, than just having 40% protein and no fat, because all of a sudden you don't have the, right. the okay. lipids to help absorb the lipoproteins. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you.